this is Michelle and it is December 14th, 2022. And um, I'm going to do a little Bible reading today out of the New Testament, out of this new Bible that I'm just really loving reading. It's, um, the, it's the one I talked about in an earlier video that it's, it's really nice. It doesn't go above fourth grade comprehension level for um, words. And it's just written very, very story-like, which I love. And um, anytime I come across a verse that I feel like I don't totally understand, or maybe there's more to it, um, things like that, then I'll always switch over and look at the King James and, and look at a King James study Bible, maybe the um, Reformation, Reformation Heritage Study Bible or the Matthew Henry those are two of um, the ones that I like to read. Oh, well, the, the Reformation Heritage Study Bible, really, it's more good for giving you the moral to the story after each chapter. That's what I really like that book, book for. Um, and then, of course, you've got to remember the commentaries are not the scripture, but there is a lot of insight in those. And then another one is the... Um, expository study Bible. If you're reading the Old Testament and just having trouble like what's going on, that that one helps me a lot. But anyway, we're going to read out of the wonderful, simple, contemporary English version, CEV it's called. This is the one I like the best because I hope, I'm not sure how we're aligned here, but this is the one with the largest print that's uh, that's affordable. It's got like, um, you have to be careful because I think there's another one that might look just like it that's not large print. So make sure it has at least 1,800 pages if you're buying it online. But it's a very nice uh, paperback. <clears throat> okay, so what I'm going to read out of today is just a, a short bit out of um, Matthew chapter 13, and I'm going to start reading at verse 18, where Jesus is explaining a story about a farmer, and, um, and then I'm going to stop, I think, at the end of where Jesus explains about the reason for teaching with stories. Now listen to the meaning of the story about the farmer. The seeds that fell along the road are the people who hear the message about the kingdom, but don't understand it. Then the evil one comes and snatches the message from their hearts. The seeds that fell on rocky ground are the people who gladly hear the message and accept it right away. But they don't have deep roots and they don't last very long. As soon as life gets hard or the message gets them in trouble, they give up. I was guilty of that around 1984 or so. Um, it fell on some rocky ground with me, but thank the Lord, he's so merciful. And and uh, the little bit I got right and, and, and helped me to get the message when the Holy Spirit made it clear to me that, hey, come on, wake up. Let's get back to the kingdom and the kingdom message and follow Jesus Christ. Just just saying I'm a Christian and going to church once a week. That's not if that's all you're doing and socializing with other people in church. That's not really following the message. We really need to read the Bible and try to follow his example. Okay, so here we go. Now, we're at Verse at Matthew 13, verse 22. The seeds that fell among the thorn bushes are also people who hear the message, but they start worrying about the needs of this life and are fooled by the desire to get rich. So the message gets choked out and they never produce anything. The seeds that fell on good ground are the people who hear and understand the message. They produce as much as a hundred or 60 or 30 times what was planted. Jesus then told them this story. 
The kingdom of heaven is like what happened when a farmer scattered good seed in a field. But while everyone was sleeping, an enemy came and scattered weed seeds in the field and then left. When the plants came up and began to ripen, the farmer's servants could see the weeds. The servants came and asked, Sir, you didn't scatter good seed in your field? Where did these come? Where did these weeds come from? I read that wrong. It says, Sir, didn't you scatter good seeds in your field? Where did these weeds come from? An enemy did this, he replied. His servants then asked, Do you want us to go out and pull up the weeds? No, he answered. You might also pull up the wheat. Leave the weeds alone until harvest time. Then I'll tell my workers to gather the weeds and tie them up and burn them, but I'll have them store the wheat in my barn. Jesus told them another story. The kingdom of heaven is like what happens when a farmer plants a mustard seed in a field. Although it is the smallest of all seeds, it grows larger than any garden plant and becomes a tree. Birds even come and nest on its branches. Jesus also said, The kingdom of heaven is like what happens when a woman mixes a little yeast into three big batches of flour. Finally, all the dough rises. Boy, that's really nice. I like that. I don't remember reading that before. I think it's said pretty differently maybe in, in the KJV, but it's... Uh, I, th I think it's, to me, it seems to be pointing out that we come to Jesus in very individual ways with individual handicaps and individual strengths and individual everything. And, but all the yeast for the good yeast rises and we make it to the kingdom of heaven, I think. That's what... That's what the plan is. Okay, and then now Jesus tells his reason for teaching with stories. Jesus used stories when he spoke to the people. In fact, he did not tell them anything without using stories. So God's promise came true, just as the prophet had said, I will use stories to speak my message and to explain things that have been hidden since creation of the world. Now let me look. I'm not sure which prophet that was. So I'm look, looking that up. That was Isaiah. The prophet Isaiah is the one who had said that. And, uh, okay. So, um, this is interesting because the weeds, they're, they're called in the King James Bible, they're called the tares spelled T-A-R-E-S and you know the, so the, the wheat and the tares they look a lot alike and it explains that he's going to send an angel or his angels to come gather the tares or gather the weeds because they can tell the difference and um, those will be those will be burned up and 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 then that way then when they get come get the the regular wheat, it, they'll all go to the God's barn. And that's also interesting if you, to notice that in this story, it's actually the wicked or the weeds that are gathered up first. For whatever that means. I mean, some people think that the rapture is going to hap happen first, and other people think maybe God's going to gather the weeds first. I'm not going to um, call that one. I'll just, I was just thought I'd mention that's one of the things people talk about, one of the little interesting controversies in the Bible, which the Bible just gets more fascinating all the time. And um, one of the things that really surprised me, and this, again, it's controversial, but I don't think it should be, but... I mean, that's just my opinion, is that in Genesis 6, um, 
it tells about how the fallen angels saw that the human women seemed lovely or attractive to them and they basically mated with human women and then the next thing it says in the Bible in the King James is that then there were giants in those days and um, it doesn't go into a lot of detail about the giants other than later in the in the Old Testament you do run across giants again and again um, sometimes they're mentioned as giants and other times it's just the name of the tribe and once after a while you kind of get to know which the names of which tribes are the giants and um, what happened what, what you find is that in uh, the Bible Enoch is mentioned several times he's mentioned in Genesis he was the great grandfather of Noah and um, he's also mentioned in Hebrews and in Jude which was written by Jesus's stepbrother or half-brother depending on what you believe I think Catholics believe he was a stepbrother and probably most Protestants believe he was a half-brother to me it's like uh, academic I don't need to know which one but you know that's fine um, it's very interesting that Jude also he I, I think he actually quoted the book of Enoch and um, the book of Enoch was possibly the first book ever written of course they didn't call them books back then they probably called them scrolls and um, Enoch it's very interesting um, it didn't really surface in our world um, too much at least in the Western world until maybe two or three hundred years ago and then only you know just like slowly through maybe some scholars and things but um, it had been around it's been around since Jesus day obviously since Paul quoted talked about Enoch and um, there's another there's somewhere else where Enoch is mentioned that I haven't said but I just can't remember right now anyhow um, when you go to what's called the first book of Enoch which um, I recommend the translation by R.H. Charles there's another good one I think the translator's name is Ken Johnson but I'm, I'm not sure about that anyway it was um, translated into English I believe in the 1700s maybe or 1800s and but it's been in the Ethiopian Bible since they had a Bible the, the OP Ethiopian Christians and I believe the Armenians as well which is very interesting because uh, a lot of people said oh we don't know if we believe this is true and all of that and then there's a place called uh, today it's called Qumran where a lot of scrolls biblical scrolls were found and they found the book of Enoch in there and it's almost word for word the same very close to to the uh, exact same as the Ethiopian Bible so has in it so um, then you add to that what else really interesting is the very first paragraph you read in the book of Enoch says that this was written for the people who are going to live the elect I think it's referred to meaning the people who are followers of the Messiah Jesus Christ it's written for those people in the latter days and I think most of us who are aware of Bible prophecy it's pretty obvious that we definitely live in the latter days and um, so I find it very interesting I believe that God supernaturally kind of kept the book of Enoch a little bit under wraps more until it was time for us to be to be reading it and um, so anyway in the book of Enoch what you find out is Enoch was very good friends with God um, he in fact I think he spent most of the year every year with God and and walking with him and doing things with him I don't know what and it doesn't really tell you so much but it does tell you this what's in this book but um, I think it was something like 
if I'm remembering correctly, 364 out of the 365 days of the year, or however many days of the year were calculated at that time, um, Enoch was with God, and he only came around people once in a while, something like that. He, anyway, so he was really close to God, and the fallen angels knew this. And this was um, about the time, or around the time, that uh, 200 of the fallen angels, this is explained in the Book of Enoch, also known as the first Book of Enoch. Let me just stop and say for a second, there's also books called the second Book of Enoch and the third Book of Enoch and other names, um, but those are written by different people. Even the one that says it's written by Enoch, it's a different Enoch. So, um, until you become to the point where you feel like you really understand the Bible and really understand the books that you consider to be, you know, really scripture or very close to scripture so that you have everything straight, there's no reason to read those other ones unless maybe you're trying to help people see that they're wrong <laughs> because they're really very, um, uh, kind of like, I think it's coming from an evil place, those other Enoch books. So anyway, in the book of Enoch, which is so amazing, the, um, to, it explains that 200 angels had con come to the top of Mount Hermon in uh, Israel. And they, uh, I don't remember the name of the main, the, the angel that whose it was his idea, but he said, hey, you know, let's get with these human women, but I don't want to do it by myself. And basically they had a conversation, it was like, Give, emboldening, emboldening each other by saying, hey, let's all do it together. I guess I'm not sure why they thought it was better to do it that way. They knew that God's very powerful and I think they kind of assumed he was going to let them off the hook. They should not have assumed that because um, it was a very direct disobedience to God that they that they did that. And they, they have Fallen angels are not humans. They're, they can look like humans, um, and, but they don't have normally have flesh bodies. They live in what's called the second heaven, which is the spiritual plane kind of in between us and the top heaven where God resides. And um, But they know how to take on flesh bodies, at least for temporary periods of time. You can see this happen a number of times in the Bible. And um, anyhow, uh, they all decided, okay, we're all going to do this. We're all going to go get with these human women. It doesn't say in the Book of Enoch as far as I know, but I think one of the reasons for doing it, besides the fact that they were feeling lustful feelings, maybe, toward the women um, or something like that <laughs> and but I think also they wanted to populate the earth with their own relatives because at that point it was all already that um, it was going to be the fallen angels versus the humans in this world that they don't they don't like us at all. They'll pretend like they do, but they really don't because we're made in God's image and they've rebelled against him. And I guess sometimes it's kind of like um, if you've ever given somebody a whole lot. I don't remember. There's, I remember this one lady and I don't even remember what I gave her, but all I remember was I was very generous with her. And then she came around again wanting more and I didn't have any more to give. And she got angry with me, and she was mad at me. Um, like, she just expected, since I'd given to her before, that I'd be able to give more. I guess that's kind of how, maybe, maybe how the fallen angels were toward God, and then when they decided to, you know, they just, they didn't want to think of themselves. I guess none of us like to think of ourselves as being bad. So instead they got into their pride and their, you know, Anyway, I don't want to go all and all into the fallen angels, but anyway, it explains about how um, the, those angels knew that Enoch was close with God. 
and they were scared to ask his forgiveness. And so they thought they could ask Enoch to be their intermediary. Would you please go tell God that, you know, ask him if he could forgive us for laying with these human women. When these human women had babies, they were giants in those days and really big giants anyway. And I, I, apparently after as time went on and it was no longer fallen angels, but it was, uh, you know, meeting with other humans or with each other, however that worked. They slowly over time got shorter. But anyway, they asked Enoch to go appeal to God for them. And so he went to God and he made the appeal, he, he, he uh, presented their appeal to God. And then God gave his answer and he went back and delivered the answer to, to the angels. And God did not forgive them. They had gone way over the line. And, um, well, the, the, the um, book has a lot in it, but now I've just given you a little teaser. So now you know if you uh, want to check out the book of Enoch. I, it does not, um, the Bible scholars I know, if there's any contradiction in the book of Enoch that contradicts the Bible, the only contradiction is, I think, in one point, it has the number 70, where the Bible has 72, or vice versa. And that maybe is a number of people in a certain council or committee. And I think that's the only contradiction that has been found. So that's a good way to know if you're reading a good book or not. Because if it contradicts what the Bible has taught you, then you know that it's not, it's not the truth. Anyway, so um, I don't want to take up too much time. I wanted to just say a little bit and um, wish you a beautiful day and um, hopefully see you again very soon because Jesus is my rock and that's how I roll. God bless.